Hello, everyone, and good evening. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Spencer Ruckty. I'm the author events manager here at Third Place Books in Seattle, Washington, and I am so pleased to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Patrick Laurie, author of Galloway, Life in a Vanishing Landscape, and Nick Offerman, uh, the actor, producer, and author of Where the Deer and the Antelope Play, the pastoral observation of one ignorant American who loves to walk outside. Uh, first of all, we have so many of you in attendance tonight. Uh, I invite you to use the chat window at the bottom of your screen uh, to say hello and tell us where you're calling in from. Uh, and second, a quick note that uh, before, we, uh, before we begin, I am obviously not Nick Offerman. Um, Nick will be joining us later tonight uh, from the green room at Jimmy Kimmel, uh, where he's preparing for yet another interview. So Nick is going to uh, be appearing on screen about 15 minutes or so into this conversation. Uh, so don't be surprised or alarmed uh, when he does. Uh, through virtual events like tonight's, uh, Third Place Books is so fortunate to continue connecting authors and readers in an intimate setting. Uh, we do sorely miss having authors in our store, especially on nights like tonight, um, but we are very thankful to have this new platform to uh, bring our growing event series into your homes all across the world. So thank you so much for coming out and for supporting independent bookstores. Uh, we're also proud to host a number of exciting virtual events this season which you can find on our website, thirdplacebooks.com, uh, where I also encourage you to sign up for our email newsletter for the latest on our wonderful author event series uh, that features events like the conversation you will be seeing tonight. So as I mentioned, the chat window is at the bottom of your screen and we encourage you to use it respectfully. Uh, tonight, we'll also have some time for your questions. So if you have questions for authors this evening, please submit those to the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we also offer closed captioning for those who are interested. Uh, just hit that live transcript button at the bottom of your window to turn this feature on or off. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. And if they do, uh, we have our Zoom experts over here. Uh, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. Overall, thank you uh, for sticking around with us during this virtual era. It's really strictly because of you that this author series is even possible. And now uh, I am pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Patrick Laurie uh, was born and raised in Galloway after earning his Master of Arts degree in Scottish language and literature at the University of Glasgow. He moved to the Isle of Harris work to work on Hebridean fishing boats. Uh, since 2010, he has balanced freelance journalism with farming and conservation projects. His new book is Galloway, Life in a Vanishing Landscape, which is part memoir, part journalism and nature writing that takes place or that takes on the delicate balance between farming and conservation while recounting a powerful personal story. The Evening Standard in the UK writes of Galloway that, quote, this is a book about a place you will probably have never visited and never will, but you should read it nonetheless because what it says has wider importance about some of what we got wrong and the way we respect nature and farming and what we might get right if we change our ways. And of course, uh, also joining us a little later tonight is Nick Offerman, the New York Times bestselling author of Paddle Your Own Canoe, One Man's Fundamentals for Delicious Living, Gumption, Relighting the Torch of Freedom with America's Gustiest Troublemakers, and Good Clean Fun, Misadventures in Sawdust at Offerman Workshop, uh, Woodshop. He is also the co-author of the book, The Greatest Love Story Ever Told with his wife, Megan Mullally. And in addition to his work as a writer, you may also know Offerman from his career as a talented woodworker and the founder of Offerman Woodshop, or from his iconic roles as both an actor and producer, from the curmudgeonly government bureaucrat Ron Swanson on Parks and Recreation, to his starring role on the reality TV show Making It with Amy Poehler. Offerman's new book is Where the Deer and the Antelope Play, uh, which we'll be hearing more about tonight and features a hiking trip to one of my favorite places in the world, Glacier National Park in Montana, with the musician Jeff Tweedy and short story master George Saunders, in addition to many witty, heartwarming stories and insights into the human condition. As I mentioned before, Nick will be joining us a little later this evening. So without further ado, uh, welcome everyone. Let's get started. Um, Patrick, thank you so much for being here. And uh, could you please tell us what time it is in Scotland right now? It's uh, seven minutes past one in the morning. Um, <laughs> well, and it's... thank you for being here. <laughs> no, not at all. It's been a, uh, you and I were talking earlier about how to sustain momentum. I haven't stopped. I've been working since lunchtime. So I haven't stopped. Um, if I do stop, I'm going to go straight to sleep. So, so let's keep the pace up. <laughs> so we'll let's just keep, keep moving. Let's keep, we'll keep talking no matter what we have to say. <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, if you'd like, uh, let's uh, go ahead and start off with the reading from Galloway. Uh, we'd love to 
get a little taste of the book. Sure. It's, it's cool to be speaking to people outside Scotland. So, so the book was actually published here in Britain um, at the start of April last year. And um, yeah, all the events, all the publicity, all the promotion stuff was cancelled um, in advance. So I've done a lot of virtual stuff, um, but it's all been largely to people who might have heard the name before, might have heard of Galloway before, mm-hmm. but um, maybe couldn't tell you too much about it. And, and maybe without jumping too far ahead of myself, I dare say there'll be... Um, leaving the country i dare say there'll be a few people who, who maybe wouldn't have even heard the word so much so <laughs> um it's uh it's I, I don't know i certainly it's something that i work on under a lot here is that i live in part of the country that that part of scotland nobody really knows about and so yeah that's kind of a big part of the book is 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 setting down what that means so so yeah i'll i'll read a bit from from the first first few pages galloway's unheard of This southwestern corner of Scotland has been overlooked for so long that we've fallen off the map. People don't know what to make of us anymore, and they shrug when we try and explain. When my school rugby team travelled to Perthshire for a match, our opponents thumped us for being English. When we went for a game in England, we were beaten up again for being Scottish. That's child's play, but now I realise that even grown-ups struggle to places. There was a time when Galloway was a powerful and independent kingdom, We had our own Gallic language, and traders, strangers, trod carefully around this place. The Romans got a battering when they came here, and the Viking Lord Magnus Barefoot had nightmares about us. In the days when longboats stirred in the shallow broth of the Irish Sea, we were the centre of a busy world. We took a slice of trade from the Irish and sold it on to the English and the Manxmen who loom over the sea on a clear day. We spurned the mainstream, and we only lost our independence when Scotland invaded us in the year 1236. Then came the new Lords of Galloway and the wild times of Archibald the Grim, and he could fill a whole book himself. The frontier of Galloway was always open for discussion. Some of the old kings ruled everything from Glasgow to the Solway Firth, but Galloway finally settled back on a rough and tumbling core, the broken country which lies between tall mountains and the open sea. This was not an easy place to live in, but we clung to it like moss, and we excelled on rocks and salt water both. We threw up standing stones to celebrate our paganism, then we laid the groundwork for Christianity in Scotland. History made us famous for noble knights and black-hearted cannibals. You might not know what Galloway stands for, but it's plain as day to us. We never became a county in the way that other places did. Galloway fell into two halves, Wigtonshire in the west and the Stuartry of Cacubri in the east. There are some fine legal distinctions between a shire and a Stuartry, but that hardly matters anymore because both of these units were deleted in 1975 when the local government was overhauled. The remnants of Galloway were yoked to Dumfries, and today the result is a mess, because the county of Dumfries and Galloway are two very different things. Dumfriesia folk mistake their glens for dales and fail to keep Carlisle at arm's length. They're jealous of our wilderness and beauty, but we forgive them because it's unfair to gloat. And besides, they have the bones of Robert Burns to console them, and don't we all know it? Perhaps Dumfriesia is a fine enough place, but we've pulled together, pulled in different directions for too long to make an easy team. Imagine a county called Perth and Fife, or Carlisle and Northumberland. Both would be smaller and make more sense than Dumfries and Galloway. But now there are trendy councillors who abbreviate this clunky mouthful to D and G, as if three small letters were enough to describe the 120 miles of detail and diversity which lie between Langham and Port Patrick. Tourist operators say we are Scotland's best kept secret, and tourists support that claim by ignoring us. It's easy to see why visitors rarely come here. They think we're just an obstacle between England and the Highlands. They can't imagine that there's much to see in the far southwest, and they tell us that Scotland begins at Perth. Maybe that's because we don't wear tartan, or maybe it's because we laugh at the memory of Jacobites and Bonnie Prince Charlie. Left to our own devices, we prefer the accordion to the bagpipes, and we'd sooner race a gird than toss a caber. If you really want to see Scotland, you'll find it further north. When Galloway folk speak of home, we don't talk of heather in bloom or the mist upon sea lochs and mountains. Our place is broad and blue and it smells of rain. Perhaps we can't match the extravagant Pibroch scenery of the north, but but we're anchored to this place by a sure and lasting bond. There are no wobbling lips or tears of pride around these parts. We'll leave that sort of carry on to the Highlanders. We'll nod and make light of it, 
but we all know that life away from Galloway is unthinkable. That's great. Hey, thank you. Um, I mean, I would love to, first of all, hear uh, a little bit more about your Galloway, um, your relationship to the place. Uh, I know you grew up there and have spent most of your life there, correct? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. But but it's it's funny, actually, there's um, I sort of dotted around. So there's like a sort of a pattern of where my family have been in Galloway, um, rather than have like one ancestral kind of farm where my family has always been. Um, I can remember as a kid driving through the place and my sort of my dad pointing out, well, your great uncle so-and-so used to live there and his uncle so-and-so used to live over the back of the hill. So I kind of had this kind of three dimensional memory of, of being all the way through, all the way through the place. And you, you can't help but go to a graveyard or a war memorial. And there's always somebody surnamed Laurie in there. Laurie's have always been, there's a, a uh -huh. well, I would say the best pub in Galloway is called the Laurie Arms. Um, and that's like two, two or three miles over the hill here. So there's lots of lorries, lots of lorries here. But yeah, it's, 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 so that's, that sense of belonging kind of set up the premise of the book. Um, and a lot of stuff kind of came, kind of came after that. But I think Galloway's been, Galloway's had a tough time over the last sort of 30, 40 years. Galloway's um, been asked to do a lot of work um, in terms of producing timber, in terms of producing dairy. Um, so a very, very traditional old fashioned place um has suddenly seriously ratcheted up in terms of what 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 the world is asking of it and that's that's come at a big cost so I, um i started out writing the book really trying to set down yeah a little bit about what galloway meant to me what it's meant to my family but also in doing that being really conscious that a lot of the things i was writing about that i said were very important are, are vanishing that they're, they're actually yeah. Um, even the book's been out now for two years. There's stuff in this book yeah. that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, it's, oh, it's happening as quickly as that. What, so what drew you to write about, I mean, obviously this is a you know deeply meaningful place to you and uh, generations of your family, but what drew you to write an entire book about it? I'm not sure I meant, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure I meant to. Um, <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote lots and I write a huge quantity of, of stuff and maybe only when I started to really see where it was heading, I suddenly, I got, probably got about, I probably had written the book and I suddenly, then I sort of stood back and went, oh my, oh my God, I think this mm -hmm. is a book. But I mean, this is from a, from a technical perspective, this is 75,000 words. Um, when I started, inverted commas, writing the book, I already had 350,000. So it was a matter then of, of really cutting down and throwing away the huge majority of it and really trying mm -hmm. to be really clear about what, what I wanted to keep. Because this could have been, yeah, this could have been five books. As, yeah. As far as I'm concerned. But yeah. I, there, was, there was never a conscious moment where I said, ooh, I want to write a That's book it. about it. <laughs> Make the pitch. Um, yeah. And also, bef so before Nick comes on, um, I did want just to give some contents, uh, context to the audience, uh, how this conversation and this event came together uh, in the first place. So Nick uh, writes the introduction for at least the U.S. edition of this book. Um, and in that introduction, he talks a little bit about how he first met you. He was one of, I think he was on one of the sojourns that he actually writes about in, in his own book. Um, and he meets you for the first time. And uh, I won't, you know, spoil that story for people in the audience who want to buy the book. But I would be very uh, curious to hear your side of the story, um, what it was like to meet uh, Nick Offerman for the first time and what the context for that meeting was. So I... I, I being very ignorant generally i i'd never heard of nick offerman um and i had no i had no idea i had no idea what that was and i had so nick came even better <laughs> <laughs> nick nick turned up with with uh, a mutual friend uh, and all i'd had in advance was a text to say um bringing a friend so i thought oh fair enough um anyway it became obvious that it was it was it was, it was an american an american person had come um, and that to me, that to me was the headline act. I was all for ringing all my friends and saying, you'll never believe we've had an American person. <laughs> um, so that was, that, that was, that was a pretty big deal. And it was only then kind of in retrospect, I started to think, yeah, I think, I, th I think there's, the, the, there's, there might be more than just an American person here. Um, and then just through bit, bit by bit, I, I, I kind of got a bit of a view about the kind of the breadth of what Nick's been involved in and started to see that, um, yeah his curiosity was more than just sort of a pass through he was he was actually really tuned into some of the stuff we talked about but that's always kind of been looking back on it that's always been kind of the nature of 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 
he and I um, being pals was that it was not founded on on any kind of preconception at all. And yeah. actually, he said, he said when we were putting together the book, he said, um, "Oh, have you got a picture? Is there? Have you got a picture of the two of us together?" I'm like, <laughs> no. Why would I have taken a picture of us together? And I'd like to welcome uh, Nick Offerman to the screen. Um, Nick, we were just talking about uh, the first time you and Patrick met, sponsored by Diet Coke. Slancha. <laughs> Slancha, <laughs> indeed. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exit the screen here. Um, I will reappear about uh, 15 minutes before the end of the hour to usher an audience Q&A. Um, but uh, have at it, you two. Thank you, Spencer. Hello, everyone. And hello, Patrick. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Nick. How's it going? Uh, it's going well. What is it, One eighteen in the morning there? Yeah, you've nailed it. Uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a fan of your time zone, so I, I look at it more often than my own. <laughs> How's it going so far? It's been fantastic. I think you've missed the best of it, I must say. I think we're just winding down now. Well, I'll go back and, and check it out. I, I just stepped off stage. I'm in my dressing room at one of our popular late night talk shows, uh, Jimmy Kimmel. And we were talking about my book and we got a nice plug in for Galloway. Uh, but he also was asking me all about visiting James Rebank's farm. And so I just I just described the, the rattling uh, system where you mark which which of your tups or rams impregnate which of your use on late night talk show television um which i love uh i also recently had something uh in gq magazine do you know that magazine mm -hmm. where they uh they talked all about wendell berry which i th i think i felt like a particular victory to get wendell into gq was that just was that just recently i think so like a week or two ago okay cool Cool. Well, no, just um, I, I just before you came on, I was um, providing a bit of background about how incredibly ignorant I am and having no idea and never having heard the name Nick Offerman before you before you swanned into my house. Um, it's interesting too to have had a conversation earlier on. I had a similar effect with with Jimmy um, Kimmel. That was a bit of Googling that I went off to do. But I understand that's a that'll be a, that, that's a, a, a big piece of work you've just done. Well, you know, it, it's it's funny that. I, I don't know how much our our sensibilities translate to a popular television audience, but there's you know I think there's always the the few uh, turnip fans that also happen to t tune into such a program. Um, that's a great that's a great question. Uh, I'd love to hear the answer to though. When when I showed up at your farm with James, uh, you, you were completely unfamiliar with me. Well, now you're making it sound like it's quite insulting, Nick. But yeah, no, I, no, I, not I, not at all. <laughs> I mean, I, I please, I I don't ever, you know, I I don't give a shit. I I'm not like Tom Cruise or anything, or uh, or Tom Hardy. I'm a you know a middle known TV actor. It's and so when I ask it, it's not uh, it's simply a matter of curiosity because then it's interesting how people react to me or not. Um, it, I must say, it it was it was interesting. I think in your in your as soon as you you were out of the truck, um, it was clear James hadn't given me any hadn't given me any steer. And if he had given me a steer, it wouldn't have been much use to me. I don't think. But um, there's a there was a there was a a, a marked sense of uh, of body language and presentation to suggest that you weren't maybe maybe you maybe weren't from the Lake District um and um that uh, yeah that 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 was that was clearish but yeah as i said earlier i was just incredibly um I'm gobsmacked to meet an american oh well i i hope i uh i represented as well um no, i know it was it was it, it was a it was it was a, a a big moment for me on that alone i'm always i'm honestly uh you know, I'm, I'm best known for this TV show, Parks and Recreation, that, um, that, that has had some popularity in both America and, and in England. Um, but I'm still ignorant enough that I'm surprised. I'm more surprised when people know me. Uh, I, I usually expect, especially people who have better things to do, like run a farm, um, 
I'm always surprised, like, oh, you, you also caught some television. That's amazing. I obviously uh, prefer book people. Um, and so here we are. Congratulations on, uh, on your American publication. Yeah, thanks. You were, I mean, you've been um, an influential figure in this, but I mean, when it came through the other day, I suddenly looked up and thought, Oh my, oh my, oh my God, it's actually being published in America. It is actually happening. Um, so yeah, it, it was, it was a, 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 yeah, a big, a big, big moment. So um, I'm yes, yeah, still trying to sort of get my head around it. Well, uh, for, for our audience, uh, which I see there's 17 of us now, welcome everyone. Um, I, uh, I'm just kidding. I, I wouldn't know where to see how many people are here. <laughs> But, oh, so I do see 77 participants. Hi, everybody. Um, so it was around early on in the, in the pandemic. Um, your book was, came out uh, in England and Scotland and Ireland and, and uh, through complications and, you know, through like general pandemic bullshit, it didn't come out as planned in America. And as a a friendly acquaintance, I was mortified to hear that because I'm a big fan of your book. And so I just said, okay, well, I know some book people. And I called them and said, hey, here's a book. <laughs> and, you know, I ha it happened to be uh, the person that it occurred to me to contact was Wendell Berry's editor and publisher of Lo These Many Years, uh, Jack Shoemaker at Counterpoint Press in Berkeley. And sure enough, he agreed with me. Your book is beautiful and imperative um, and right up our alley. And so it was a no brainer, you know. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm glad if it, that I was able to help, but if it wasn't me, it would have been the next jackass. Uh, you know, I, I love being in a similar conversation that, that you're in and that you're pursuing. Um, so well-deserved and I, I hope that it, it does uh, some good business because it's not a piece of entertainment that I want to sell to people. It's a, it's a book full of thoughts and ideas and, and even a little bit of romance that I think uh, could serve as good medicine to all of us. It's funny um, to think that it has that, or it might have that kind of broad appeal. I did a, um, given that it's it's uh, getting on for being late at the late at night here, um, I did an event earlier on today discussing bits and pieces to do with this book. Although it does feel like three weeks ago already. Um, Welcome. Talking, well, to, we were talking about um, trying to write for farmers or trying to write about farming in a general sense, and the consensus seemed to be that you you can't. You've got to be able to write about what you do and know that some of it's transferable if you write well enough about what you do that'll carry much better than trying to write something that's going to please everybody and then inevitably fall in between the stools but what what i found ex exciting was writing this book almost in isolation here in a very small town very remote little part of scotland people in england wanted to read it and i thought wow god actually that might it must be but the idea that it's sufficiently transferable to actually have people i mean where you are now however many eight hours beh behind where i am just now time time zone wise the idea that it actually says something to you is of is of is is a great encouragement i suppose well that's i mean to me that's the crux of the thing is you you know have chosen with with your bride to farm this uh small uh, traditional family farm in in Dalbady. Is that how I say it? Dalbady. Yep. You've nailed it. Yep. Um, uh, in in the uh, the region of Galloway and Dumfries, uh, if I have that straight as well. Yep. Uh, which which most people will never get to. Will never get to see. Uh, but. The, what what your subject matter is about and and the life choices that you're detailing uh, I'd like to ask you why despite your remote location 
in a, in a far off you know corner of Scotland for God's sake. Uh, why should why should Americans care about the way you're choosing to farm and and the lifestyle you're pursuing and and how that applies to our relationship with nature and farming? Wow. It's really interesting when you talk, I know maybe you're not talking specifically about Americans, but people from far away. Um, I mean, there's a big, big interest in this country about in, in the UK about writing about nature and about connecting with the natural world and being part of being present in being present in nature. But it's, but it's quite, it often feels quite urban based. It feels quite like um, visitors to the countryside, people from towns come to the countryside and kind of recharge their batteries and then go back out again. And, and to me in this country, it felt like there weren't many writers who, who were here all the time anyway. And almost, you almost can't escape from the countryside if that's your daily bread anyway. And it's interesting you mentioned uh, how it would appeal to Americans because I would have said, a lot of the inspiration for this book came from American writers who in lots of ways, I think have better and more pragmatic thoughts and expressions, literary thoughts and expressions about living in a place and about belonging in a place than we do in this country. Cause I think we're, we're quite often like, even at, I was so before you came, I read a little bit from the book. And I mean, I'm talking about stuff that happened like 800 years ago in this place. So, I mean, everything you do here is just, crushingly heavy in terms of baggage and background and everything and it's really difficult to get out of that and, and and the american writers who i really admire including wendell berry um it's not that they're it's not that they have any easier time but they're just they're just coming at it from a different angle and and maybe probably in wendell berry that immediate that that shorter term history but that much more painful short term history kind of puts a different light on it and i found that much more accessible than some of the stuff that we might write in this country so it's so yeah maybe i kind of danced around your question without really gripping it but um it's it, it's an, there is an interesting connection i think we can learn a lot in britain from some of the best american writers and also as well you meet writers who write about far, perhaps not about farming but people who write about nature in this country they might not know about wendell berry and they might not know about like Aldo Leopold. They might, they might, like, there might be people out there who don't know about these big American figures, and yet they're like the big deal in America. And yet they don't. It feels a bit niche to talk about Wendell Berry in Britain. Um, but I mean, I, I don't know. When you, I know you're a huge advocate of Wendell Berry's, but are you pushing an open door in America, or, 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 or what? What's your reception like when you start to to really thump the text and, and get into it? Um, similar. I mean, it's, I'm always surprised, you know, that, that, uh, I find him to be considered niche as well, you know, that, that when I use the term agrarian in conversation, I'm always met with a facial expression that makes me stop and say, it's a, it's a, <laughs> a, a farming philosophy, uh, that, you know, using, using the resources of an ecosystem equitably, in a sustainable way uh, for both us and the other memberships of the ecosystem. Um, and so uh, that, that fact alone, the, the, you know, it's like when I talk to people about the music of Tom Waits and, and they look at me blankly and I say, well, you, I guess you haven't heard music. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, I happily, that's, that's what my last book is, is trying to do is, is engender that conversation um, with, with lessons that come both from friends like you in, in, uh, in England, who, I mean, the, the things I see you get up to and James and his family, um, in a, in a place where there's a much longer history of traditional agriculture, uh, uh, much of which takes place in James' case, uh, like in a national park setting, um, and the way that the way that your country's uh, the, the place your country chooses to place its subsidies versus America, I also think is a marked marked difference, and so. Our history is much more brief, 
our support where it lies is much more corporate based and much more like industrial thinking, you know, um, it's, I think, I think it, uh, one of the things I find so inspiring about you and your efforts on your farm is that I think it's more difficult to pull that off in the States. Um, but in, in either case, I think that both of our populations just need to keep hearing. We need, we need to keep uh, fomenting this conversation because it's, it's so much at the heart of, you know, the whole climate change conference that just took place, you know, down the road from you uh, didn't have a lot of talk of, uh, of Galloway cattle. That, that I could find um, or, or regenerative farming in any way. And so I found that to be pretty disappointing. Um, what was your takeaway from that whole Glasgow situation? Uh, it was so, it was so, it really was quite nearby. I mean, it's had a hundred little knock on effects. It's an hour and three quarters in the road, uh, up the road from here. Um, I've been aware, I've been physically aware that it has been happening, um, but I d I'm not sure, I don't know whether I'm just being incredibly pessimistic about it, but I'm not sure whether I went into it s seriously, seriously believing that this was going to be the seed change and this was going to be the moment. I, I I don't know, Some somehow I have a sense that there's, there's still some pretty serious log jams and if we can make an agreement i i mean i could have made the agreement that they signed the real thing is going to be doing it actually delivering it um so i think we're it has been unsettling to see um the kind of trumpeting and excitement that's come out of signing the agreement almost as if that's job done and then i don't know we'll make another agreement next year and actually we'll just slowly just drown in agreements um but like there's i know we in terms of in terms of agriculture um there were it was because we're so nearby there was an, uh, an idea that people were going to be able to come down delegates be able to come down to galloway and do farm visits and get a bit of an idea about how to kind of kind of showcase some of this stuff but what with it being covid what with it being short notice what with it being a hundred different log jams i'm not sure any of that i'm not sure any of that really happened so um i don't know yeah, maybe I'm maybe I'm just being pessimistic about it. And in a way, I really want to resist the temptation just to shut up and do my best on my bit. And and and, and I would really love to keep my arms open to the world and 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 try and feel like part of a bigger solution. But yeah, from a farm perspective, it's tempting sometimes just to just to just to batten down the hatches and, and do what I know is the right thing to do. But but I mean, if we all did that individually, we're, we're not going to get there. That's 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 the kind of temptation I'm, I'm struggling with. Well, that, yeah, that's the conundrum is that that I think that is the work that needs doing. And that's at the heart of Wendell Berry's writing and Aldo Leopold and others uh, and yours and James uh, that, that basically details, look, here's what me and my family can do in this local place. And here's what this local place has has here. Here's what has borne fruit to those who have, who have come before us. Here's the mistakes some of my ancestors have made that I think we can improve upon. Here's some wounds we've exacted upon the land that perhaps I can try and heal, but that's only true of my locality. And so that has, that has to happen in every one of all the myriad localities, you know, around the planet. And so those of you that are, that are, in charge of the small farming efforts, that is exactly what we need you to do. But we also need a voice. We need to somehow bring the administration around to helping support that system. You know, it's uh, it, we need uh, in, in America, we need a federal recognition, which is just non existent, of small farming efforts. And, and we need policy where that's where the value is understood, you know, the stewardship of the land requires a limit of scale so that you have few enough acres so that you and your, and your family 
can pay attention to its health. If, as, soon, as soon as you go big, uh, you no longer can, you know, can tell us how healthy your soil is or, you, or the, the health of your stream or your becks. Um, and so that's, you know, th that's the conversation I want to keep, uh, I want to keep going. And that's, that's at the heart of why I wanted your book to be available in America, because you take that subject matter and present it very charismatically with a lot of humility. Um, uh, you, you, you know, speak very uh, plainly about mistakes that you've made um, that, are, that are physically painful. But earlier, I've had, I've had a, a busy day myself. Earlier somewhere, I made a note of a quote from your book. Where the hell did I make that? And I'm just going to try and get, paraphrase it, but it's something about how it, it was saying that you should, that you pursue the kind of work that will make your hands calloused and scarred, um, and that and that there's pain involved, but maybe that's what makes it the best work to have or the, the best work to do. And you 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 present that in a package surrounded with. Uh, beautiful writing, you know, with the, you, you give a wonderfully honest description of getting buying this used tractor and getting it running, but then suddenly there, there's poetry uh, that is is woven in to the prose, and um, and so I mean I liked you already, and I loved seeing the efforts you and Tina were making on your farm, and and so I was already poised to be a cheerleader. And then I read your book and was like, oh, shit, <laughs> uh, this requires no selling for me other than here, if you like good writing, please read this. It's, it's funny. What's, so it's, it's flattering and brilliant and exciting to hear all that you've said. I think there's, there's two things from that. One maybe is more of a comment, but the other is a question back to you. The comment slightly about um, getting things wrong. Um, for me, lots of the, I mean, it's slightly counterintuitive, but lots of the things that I would have said were really important to me about being here and farming here and beyond farming, but living here, in retrospect, turn out to be in some ways kind of a bit harmful and a bit, a bit bad, a bit against the direction of travel here. So, I mean, we... Um, dig peat my family's always dug peat um dry peat and burn it as fuel which is just the worst thing you can do for releasing greenhouse gases we also burn heather on the hill to reduce to improve the grazing which is generally pretty not not, not great in terms of its kind of sustainability credentials um but for me it was quite important not to be too apologetic about that kind of stuff maybe to put it in context to understand that it's not it's not maybe something just to recklessly continue but also to understand these things in the context of the fact that this has actually been really important to my family for centuries mm -hmm. and actually it's quite easy to say heather burning's bad peat digging's bad you have to stop both those things if you've never done either of them it's easy to say that but sure. what if what if your granddad did that and what if you what if your main memory of him is doing that with him and you feel close to his memory when you're doing it and so there's lots of kind of little wrinkles around trying to trying to to build and hold on to a sustainable business financially and environmentally while also trying to hold all the heritage all the culture all the family all the all the stuff so so i'm pleased in a way you picked up on that but but one thing that one thing that tickles me and i have to this came in the post you were very kind to have sent me and also i've been been um flying through it and around it and all over it in this country particularly farmers there's quite, like farmers generally are old and they really they have this kind of banked sense of credential this 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 ability to speak comes from generations of being ground into the floor by incredibly hard work and when i was writing my book i was thinking god am i qualified like am i qualified to write about this kind of stuff um and it really tickles me in your book that you 
you understand yourself as an observer so you dip in and out of these kind of engagements and you you're you're clearly the visitor in these in the, but but i wondered whether the how that carried over so when you're writing about going to visit james or when you're writing about about that kind of hands-on manual side of this i wonder i wonder whether that does that bug you is that something you're cautious of is that something that that you kind of embrace i i don't it felt it felt like you one of the really cool things about your book was it felt like you were able to switch channel on that so you're able to be in california and then be in cumbria and actually even in the same paragraph that was that's really cool the way you did that but i wonder i wonder how you felt about doing that well i i feel i know what you're getting at and i i feel like because i come i come at it uh from the point of view of a laborer. Uh, I spent a lot of my life working as a carpenter and grew up in a family of laborers. Uh, and I still maintain my wood shop in Los Angeles. And so, um, I, I, I mean, I, f I feel like, you know, it's, it's casual journalism insofar as I'm not a, uh, I'm not a complete fish out of water. Like, I sort of relish the ability, like I can use, if, if you're, if you have a tool with a handle, I can generally use it, including on the island of Isla when I had to uh, cut peat for, uh, for a shoot one time. It took me a, a little while to really get the hang of it where I could cut the full length of the, of the square. I don't know if you call it a log or whatever, but and, and, and toss them and, you know, make a proper pile. And so that, to me, that's the glue, that's the connective tissue that I can, I can talk about my work and my experience in California. And then I can suddenly find myself in the Lake District stacking a stone wall in a, in a chilly uh, drizzle. And, and it's the same, I, I'm the same as James. I'm the same as any other person with two hands and a brain, uh, stacking a stone wall, making a Windsor chair, you know, uh, s setting, sorting out Herdwick tups and U's and, and, you know, building fence and what have you. Uh, so, I mean, I am quick to point out the, the one place that I bristle is because I have a certain visibility or like if I go on a talk show, especially my third book was actually a woodworking like textbook. Uh, often when I'm introduced people, because they love hyperbole and they love showbiz, they will introduce me as a as master woodworker, Nick Offerman. And I always have to stop and say, hey, listen, thank you. I'm, I will never be a master woodworker because I'm here talking to you guys. I'm, I'm traveling the world, entertaining people and trying to disseminate my ideas and my, my values. Uh, the master woodworkers are in their shop right now pursuing mastery. <laughs> and I, I am lucky that I can like build you a competent dining table or a canoe, but, but I can tell you 10 people immediately who could do it much better because they are master woodworkers. And so as long as I maintain the, the sensibility of a pilgrim of, uh, of a disciple, you know, like I'm, I'm here and I'm game to try my hand. And I, and I think it's important to point out as we both do in our writing that uh, our efforts will always necessarily be flawed. Um, I think that's, that's a very important part about this entire conversation is, is that we as a human civilization try ideas, some of them work, uh, some of them don't, none of them ever work perfectly, ever. And even if they did, it wouldn't last because something will evolve, something will be exhausted, you know. Uh, you're, the system of, of burning peat for, for heat, I understand, you know, how it's bad. It's, it's, it's similar in a lot of ways to burning coal, you know, uh, it's a fuel source that takes way longer uh, to, to be created than it does to, to exhaust. But what are the alternatives? Like burning heating oil that has to be extracted and you know, it, 
it's it's like harvesting peat. It just comes from from somewhere else, or cutting down a forest and burning it, or you know, elect, electric heat, which is powered. But so we we haven't figured out the the dream scenario yet, and it's good to recognize that and say, look, we our hearts are in the right place. Let's recognize the nuance in this peat conversation, um, but and let's keep seeking a, a proper solution. And that's that's the best we can do. I think, I think when you talk about that sense, you so you said the sensibility of a pilgrim. That's that's what makes it. That's what makes it. That's what makes your book work for me, because you are skipping between a world that I know back to front to a world that I I really honestly struggle to imagine. Your and we've said this before, back and forth in email. I struggle to imagine your your American life, and yet the book. Is able to jump back and forth between it, and it doesn't make my head explode because because you're for a start you're the constant in it. But one thing that 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 I've really struggled with, really battled with, in terms of trying to find the balance between being am I a farmer who's a writer or am I a writer who's a farmer? Re certainly, when I started writing this book, I was really anxious about trying to completely immerse myself in the activity that i was that i was working on to really take the full experience of people who might have done this for centuries before me and 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 i was then stuck in kind of the in the paradox of being the person who was trying to write about the experience so every time i reached for my pen i was like oh no i'm being inauthentic and they go oh no well no i can't so it's like when you're saying about being the master the master woodworker the master the real farmers who I'm trying to write about and who in a way I'm writing for, even though I knew they wouldn't read this book because they don't read books. And true enough, they haven't read this book. My neighbors, the people who I work with day to day, trying to get into their heads while also keeping a toe in the, with a tape recorder on. I don't know. I really struggle with that because that felt like I was kind of betraying the purity of what I was trying to work on, but sure. also being a shapeshifter in that as well. I, I hear you. And I think, you know, you have to just give yourself permission to be both. You know, I think the same question could be put to all of these writers that inspire us. You know, I think Wendell Berry would probably say, uh, well, I, I'm a farmer who, and when it's raining, I go in the shed and I write a poem, you know, and, and that's, you know, everybody is more than one thing you know are you are you a mother or a bus driver make up your mind sure. and and so all we can do in, in both our cases is uh, is give it our our best go um and i i applaud you and think you're you're doing a hell of a job the the farmers that you think you know that are the real farmers uh, you're you're right. I mean, the sort of real woodworkers I'll never meet. They're they're in the in the hollers of Appalachia, just cranking out hickory bark chairs, you know. And it's and, and that's you know that's part of the fuel of, of what drives me. But it, for me, it's it's using myself to bridge to act as a bridge between their sensibility. And what is good about their experience, and try to f try to feed that and shuttle it to a modern readership, in the hopes that some you know someone smarter than me will say, "Oh, that gives me an idea for a, something that will work better than burning peat." Sure, Spencer, um, I'm not. Yeah, uh, sorry, you're you're are you keen to get on to questions oh, or... yeah i mean if you two want to keep talking that's fine but we do have a you know a series of questions from the audience uh, and i'm happy to usher in that segment well no i just i just i just had one yeah one other one other thing on i can't resist the opportunity to sort of patronize you nick but <laughs> um <laughs> uh that switching the, you being the common thread the the pilgrim the traveler the the the, the open eyes it, the book felt to me like you are flicking back and forward to me it feels like you're flicking back and forward and in a way you're flicking back and forward between lots of things um geographically you're flicking around but it feels as well like you're flicking back and forward between 
oh oh dear there's big problems in the world versus here's the answer and the way the way those two are matched together generates something that's really coherent you're making you're making a point but i don't know i wonder how you with the exception of the islands of kind of safety and security and sanctity you find in the world i wonder how optimistic or how buoyant you are in some of the mo- sort of the darker themes and the things that concern you i wonder how d- does that does it get you down or, and and how do you get how do you how do you how do you survive between the gasps of oxygen that you describe in this book well, I'll try and keep this brief because you're not doing a great job of uh, talking about your book with me. Um, <laughs> this I, is your. This is your. This is. This is. A, this is a double header. This I double header. <laughs> um, I was just going to say that. I. Uh, it's interesting the way I write. Um, you know, I ha- I have this idealized sensibility um, that never works of of when I'm going to write a book there's a cabin that I love to visit in Minnesota when I go fishing with my family and it's away from the other cabins. It's up on a hill overlooking a lake with a screened in porch. And it's, it's the idyllic setting. So when I think, you know what, I would love to just go stay in that cabin for months and just write my book. And of course, uh, I have been able to work in that cabin for up to like a week at a time. So I, I have had it. I've, I've had tastes of it, but generally I have the idea for a book and as, as I'm compiling and writing, uh, especially in the case of this book, uh, things would get in my way where I'd get this acting job that would take me to Santa Cruz and then took me to Manchester, England and so forth. And, it, and the book was about our relationship with nature or lack thereof and turned out uh, instead of getting in the way of my book, in Santa Cruz, California, or Manchester, England, they also conveniently had nature there. And so wherever I went, I was like, oh, this it doesn't matter what I do or where I go at all. I can fit it all neatly into my themes one way or another. Um, and I, th- I haven't thought about it from the point of view of the question you just asked, but I think the answer to your question is sort of subconsciously uh, I choose these projects and this subject matter to fuel my hopeful side or to, to, to try and give me optimism because I mean just the news today in America like the, no matter which story you were watching it was like a murder trial where the judge is like, we're, listen, we're not going to call these murder victims victims. Let's, let's start there. And then you've changed the channel and they're like, uh, if, a, if a vaccine will prevent a deadly virus, should we take that vaccine? And just all, all of these crazy questions. And there's, there's an American congressman who like tweeted a cartoon of him killing another congressperson. And they're like, is this guy, is this bad? Should we, uh, <laughs> should we do something about this or, um, or should we just let it slide? And so wherever I turn, there are reasons for cynicism and there, there are reasons for uh, depression, you know, and, and to see the darker side of humanity. And so I think that I, it's, it's truly just part of my, my own survival and sanity is to sort of seek out when I, you know, incongruously found James Rebanks on Twitter. (laughs) Like I I found, you know, my, my remote Lake District shepherd refuge by like seeing him on the social media. But I, man, I locked in and was like, you goddamn right, I'll take the train to your farm and I will stand out in the rain with you as long as you will have me because those assholes on the news are not there and and i know that what you're trying to do uh is is on the the side of of good uh my own my my own shitting stumbling human experience uh can only be positive if i do my best to make more than i destroy 
Um, and I'm a human being. So like, I have to reset that every day. <laughs> Even when things go well, I have to be like, okay, today's a new day. Try to use good manners, try to do more good than damage. And, you know, engendering that conversation in others, uh, turns out can become a book. Um, and then I don't have to pour concrete. Well, shall we uh, uh, spend a few minutes here on uh, questions from the audience? We have a few pretty good ones um, I'm very excited about. And one good uh, Wendell Berry one that I uh, will start off with, if that's okay with the both of you. Fine by me. Are you satisfied, Patrick? Holy. Excellent. All right. Our first question comes from Mark. Uh, he asks, or he says, I can definitely see shades of Wendell Berry in both of your books, as well as Aldo Leopold and James Rebanks, who you both mentioned. Uh, who are the other literary figures you were thinking about when you were writing about your books? Uh, and is there anyone who might surprise us? Nick, I think, you probably, I think you, 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 you'll start on this one, I think, Nick, won't you? I, I will happily dive in. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of them. I, uh, when I was in Manchester in the bookstore, I picked up a wonderful book called The Lonely Mountain. I, now I'm, I'm blanking or... But by, by Nan, oh hell, uh, Nan, Nan Larkin. Shepherd. Uh, Nan Shepherd. Nan Shepherd, mm -hmm. about the Cairngorms. Yeah. Um, and it had an introduction by Robert McFarlane, and I, I love reading his books, and Bill Bryson, who's an American turned Brit who writes wonderfully uh, about walking and observing human nature. Rebecca Solnit. Uh, is, is an incredible thinker and she has a beautiful book um, about walking. Um, and, uh, you know, it, and like Aldo Leopold, I discovered by reading Wendell Berry, you know, at some point early on, he says, well, if you haven't read the Sand County Almanac, go read that and then come back. Um, and he also turned me on to uh, an incredible writer and artist named Harlan Hubbard. He and his wife uh, wrote a few books. They, they lived on, they made shanty boats. They would make like their own houseboat and live on different American rivers in this incredibly sustainable sort of light footprint way. They would keep a garden. They'd find a place where they could tie up in the spring and they would grow a, a season of, of garden vegetables. And then they would head south, you know, down the Mississippi uh, to winter. Harlan Hubbard is his name. So, I mean, all of these, any, any writers who, you know, who write about um, doing things in a self-sustaining way, I, those always thrill me. I think what, lots of what you've just said that Nick, completely rings a bell with me. I'm, I'm, as I say, on that kind of journey from being a farmer, writer, writer, farmer, starting to actually get really quite interested in writing. Um, I'm getting more fixated by poetry and I get a lot out of, um, get a lot out of poetry and using that poetry to drive my prose because I'm not clever enough or brave enough to write poetry. Um, but particularly, I mean, it's only about 90 miles from where I'm sitting now to Northern Ireland. Um, I'm obsessed with Seamus Heaney, I'm a big fan of Ted Hughes um, there's a Welsh writer called R.S. Thomas, who I'm, I'm, I'm very, very attached to. Um, those guys represent a sort of an agricultural aesthetic from like the 1950s, 60s, 70s, kind of almost like the last gasp of traditional agriculture. But they're not so much documenting what things were like at the time. They're more recording human experience, which in itself doesn't date doesn't get it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't feel old so um yeah i'm quite interested i'm quite interested in i'm quite interested in writing about agriculture but not being too finger waggy not being too instructive not being too sort of bossy about it i don't know the answer and as i said earlier lots of stuff that i do is wrong it's not actually good for the environment but i am really interested in that relationship which preoccupies all the writers that you've just talked about there nick that kind of relationship between farming producing food living in a place occupying a place belonging to a place so those three 
writers i've just been writing something about them as a as, as a threesome they they fill my fill my imagination completely um so yeah i'm 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 pretty pretty obsessed with with those guys and i'll springboard off of that just to add mary oliver mm -hmm. to, to the yeah list. totally uh, and she has a, especially specifically a wonderful poem called look and see which is also the title of the wendell berry documentary that i helped to produce no, Excellent. yeah she she's she's um actually you know she's very hard to find in the it, it, in in the uk i find it very oh, hard right? to find oh. her work it's, it's quite easy to to buy to buy books online to buy her books online but like to go into a bookshop and find I, yeah i've never gone into a bookshop and been able to find anything by anything by mary oliver and i would love to be able to i i know i know exactly what you mean nick well i'm sure there are are people from black wells and, and waterstones watching this talk so <laughs> take Stock this yes yeah. admonition mary oliver please <laughs> Excellent. Um, let's see. Dan asks, uh, are there ways we can apply agrarian philosophies in our own home and community, even if we ourselves are not farmers or have large plots of land? Hell yeah. I mean, the, uh, the first and foremost, you know, Wendell Berry, and also uh, Michael Pollan is, is a wonderfully uh, palatable read. His big hit book was The Omnivore's Dilemma. And, and the whole point is Wendell says that eating, eating is an agricultural act. If you like food, then you better start giving a shit about who's producing that food and where it's coming from. Something that we've, that we've you know, sold ourselves the, uh, the casual idea that we don't need to worry about that. And that's the cause of so much across the the spectrum of climate change problems and health problems and, and uh, de uh, food desert problems and then on and on. Um, and so no matter who you are and where you are, you, you should know everything you can about all of your food. Um, and one way that you can do that is to find out who is locally making good food, whether it's it's produce or meat or dairy or, or what have you. Get to know the farmer's markets, get to know the CSAs, which are uh, fantastic uh, produce delivery programs. Um, that's, that's the thing I do the most of, is just knowing, trying to, trying to, trying to make sure I know who's raising my, my meat and eggs. Uh, in the way that is the most healthy for the chickens and the soil and this guy. I would, uh, yeah, I think that's, there's loads of that, loads of that kind of overlap in, in Britain too. I would say though that my, something that's really kind of jumped over the wall and grabbed me by the throat a little bit about farming is that it forces you to be super aware of your surroundings and it forces you to be very present in whatever piece of work it is that you're doing at the time and actually that varies throughout the course of a morning you might be um, doing stuff with waterworks water pipes you might be fixing a tractor you might be checking sheep you might be doing a number of things but each one of those things requires your full concentration in a way that I, I certainly, when I got into this, wasn't used to giving my whole self to. And that's part of my interest in those writers we just talked about there. It's not necessarily about farming the literal reality, the technicality of what you're doing when you're farming. It's more that kind of immersion in a place. And I think actually follow that to its conclusion. You don't actually have to be farming. And that's where I think um if yeah if you properly unravel some of this stuff it, it it's more of a mindset which you can pick up and apply to whatever it is you do for a living and wherever you live that that awareness of the weather that kind of connection with um the real the real specifics of what you're working on without being bugged by your telephone without being bugged by all the stuff that's going on around you um to me that fa my farming has really punched me in the face with that and that would for me would be like 
one of the what I would say one of the main things I've taken from the last 10 years of my life is, is the ability to start to start doing that and as I say you wouldn't necessarily have to be running a farm looking after however many cows or sheep to do it it's it's more a skill set that you can apply anywhere once you've once you've really got it and farming is a great way to start looking at it and start thinking about it I, and I, I would just jump on the back end of that because you reminded me of uh, something you write about uh, powerfully in your book which which are the the conifer the the pine tree plantations um in your neighborhood. And, and so another thing that you can do besides uh, sort of knowing where your food is sourced is to maintain uh, an understanding, which for me is mainly through reading works like these, uh, of these sensibilities so that you can then vote accordingly um, in support of local efforts and small farming uh, programs rather than factory farms. I mean, the uh, in in America, the last couple of years, there's this huge campaign uh, against cheeseburgers, and it's been somehow conflated that it's actually, you know, just beef that is that is what is bad, when in fact it's the industrial the factory creation of, of beef and pork and chicken, which, which is a, an absolute abomination uh, that's inarguable. But uh, if, if you maintain an awareness of this, uh, a friend of mine wrote a great book called Sacred Cow. It's also a, a great documentary, which actually James appears in and I, I narrate. Um, but it's, it's simply explaining how actually good and regenerative proper uh, beef farming is for both the, the landscape, the grazing, um, and the, the health of the animals and the people and so forth. And so it's continuing to maintain an awareness and basically any, anything that seems like it's coming from a corporation, like a big company swooping in and saying, I've got the solution, will create meat in a laboratory and sell it to you through our fast food restaurants around the planet. That's probably not where you wanna place your vote. So we, it's up to all of us to maintain an education and things like that. But factory, uh, fake meat is not the answer. It's, uh, it's much worse for you than, than properly raised meat. And it's also, uh, a terrible it's it, there's, there's no such thing as as vegan uh produce no matter what you grow even if it's just a field of garlic you're killing a lot of animals to do that so let's continue to educate ourselves uh we have time for just two more quick questions um it looks like we have one for nick and one for patrick and then we'll wrap up the night um I'll start off with this question for Nick, uh, which is close to my heart. Um, Venus asks, have any of your adventures brought you to Washington State? Uh, and I will add uh, Washington State National Parks. I, uh, I lived in Seattle for a time when my wife was uh, in the musical of Young Frankenstein. They opened at the Paramount in Seattle before taking it to Broadway. And so I had a wonderful time living in the, the Belltown neighborhood uh, and just being Mr. Mullally, I took care of the dogs. And, uh, when she would come home at night, I'd bring her her pipe and her slippers. Um, and so during the day, I, I rented a mountain bike and cycled all over the place uh, and took the ferries to the islands and, and just had an incredible time. And I happened to be there for a few of the good months of the year, meaning it wasn't raining constantly. Um, and I've also had a, a great time in Spokane uh, and, uh, you know, found basically Washington to be an incredibly gorgeous place. And I hope that uh, it's the kind of thing I don't like to talk about too much because I don't want it to become overcrowded. So now that I think about it, it was only OK. It was fine. Yeah. Don't bring people here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and final question of the night, uh, Patrick, oh, where does writing fall into the rigorous labor of farm work? 
not easily. Um, <laughs> and I keep thinking this has been one of the problems I've had since I've been trying to trying to to write more and really focus in on my writing is actually when am I going to get time to do it? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I suppose I keep thinking, well, do you know what? I'll take next week off or I'll try and get away or I'll, and, and there is never there is never a good time. And, and I suppose I probably just have to come to terms with I, I read an essay recently about finding time to write. And I think there would be if we could get our heads around it more clearly when I speak to writers or people who want to get into writing, their biggest roadblock is making space, making time to do it and making time to prioritize it. Um, I read an essay, which, I, as I say, I'm not sure whether it's helpful or whether it's sort of just excruciatingly um, sort of um, um, self-destructive, but um, it was just a reminder that some of the greatest poetry of the 20th century was produced in the trenches of the First World War. Um, those guys didn't have a, a week off to go and find themselves and do some writing. Um, that writing was so urgent and so important to them that they made time to do it. And feeling humbled by my own tiny problems, um, yeah, it's a pretty piss poor effort if I can't carve out enough time to devote. Right, there is no shortcut to this. It's it's really hard, really time consuming. It just destroys your life. Um, yeah, you you've got to you've got to just feed it hours, and 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 there's no way there's no way around that. So um, not. It, it's not a it's not a it, what with farming being similarly time consuming the two yeah it's 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 a bit of a nightmare yeah well speaking of time um i'm so grateful for both of your time uh patrick i know it is now 2 15 a.m in the morning for you um please everyone uh these are wonderful books uh galloway where the deer and the antelope play uh, they are available at thirdplacebooks.com or at any one of our three locations in the seattle metro area at lake forest park ravenna or seward park uh before we close out the night uh, do either of you have any final thoughts you want to share um i i would just ask everyone you know it, it's a strange time to um get into any conversations with new people that don't quickly devolve into uh, political rancor. And so um, I am promoting the slogan, hug before punch. And, uh, and I, I think that, you know, um, I try to think about everybody coming onto my porch. And if, if you do, I'm not gonna ask you who you voted for. I'm gonna ask you if I can get you a sandwich. And if we can, uh, if, if we can somehow bleed that sensibility into the way we react with one another in our communities, uh, we'll, maybe we'll come out of it in the end shaking hands. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, no, uh, I can't help but add to um, hug, don't punch. Actually, once your hugging is quite a good opportunity to get a quick punch in, but as long as the, as long as the hug... The, the, the long as the hug <laughs> As long as the hugs were grinding, um, more than anything, Nick, from what you said about just the commonality and 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 um, reach reaching out, I, I think again maybe go back to the idea that we came up with the came up with at the beginning is I honestly I can't get that across. You maybe would need to read the book. I really do live in the middle of nowhere, um, so it's extraordinary that I've uh, uh, the book that's that's come together is it had this conversation and actually there were people who are i don't even know for i think it's four and a half thousand miles away you guys uh some of you um yeah it's really cool to think that there's that expression i don't know whether it's sort of it was sort of a second world war era thing hands across the sea that was quite, just quite a nice um quite a nice reminder this evening and this conversation to think that um yeah we've got a lot more in common than we are told we do mm -hmm. well, yeah. it, and it was it was a very good tray of brownie you go on and on about it. You go on and on about it. Well, here, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, 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 you're very kind, Nick, and I'm only sorry that we get to see each other so rarely, but we'll see each other again soon, I hope. I'm hoping to make it over there for lambing, so I'll try and come shake hands and, and take you up on that pint. Do that. Let's do it. Excellent. Right. Well, cheers, everyone. Have a wonderful evening, and please be well. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>